Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and a, and a considerable challenge to uh, try to follow our first, our, our previous uh, speaker, and I'll, I'll try to live up to this. You, you see here, in fact, a, not the exact uh, a model of a ruby laser that Ted Mayman first made, as, as described by uh, Professor Towns, but something very, uh, very close to it. And I'm retired, I'm required by the terms of my retirement payments at Stanford to mention that he was a Stanford PhD, uh, uh, Stanford PhD uh, uh, graduate. Now, if, if you ask yourself, what are the kind of the background physics that we need to understand uh, uh, the laser or to make, to make the laser, certainly you would need a lot of knowledge in the science of light, including electromagnetic theory and, 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 the, and the engineering concepts of waves and uh, eigenmode expansions, and so you'd, 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 uh, that certainly would bring up the names of Newton and Maxwell and uh, Lord Rayleigh and probably a number of others, and then you would need to know something about the spectroscopic properties of atoms and molecules um, and uh, uh, how they emit and absorb light, and that would probably bring up the names of uh, Fraunhofer and Bunsen and Kirchhoff and others. Um, and you would probably, even if you didn't have a real quantum mechanics uh, knowledge or a theory of quantum mechanics, you'd want to understand some of the quantum ideas and concepts that helped explain this, and so you'd be talking about the uh, knowledge contributed by people like Max Planck and Bohr and perhaps Tyndall and Wien and Stefan and Boltzmann and, and Einstein himself. Uh, so if you, if you had this uh, knowledge, you would be somewhere uh, uh, in where uh, I'm, I'm going to start the, the history, uh, the, the active history of this talk around uh, uh, in the pre-quantum era in uh, 1900 to 1910. And it was in that era uh, that Einstein first proposed uh, what we now call stimulated emission uh, that makes possible masers and lasers. And let me just uh, tell you that I'm going to uh, uh, take a very rapid, try to lead you on a very rapid walk across this, uh, this timeline here through the quantum era, World War II, post-World War uh, era, and uh, the Maser era, and uh, and uh, so uh, as we as we go forward through this, you you I won't try to say all the names on here, but you can identify the uh, uh, some of them will come up as I discuss it in, in more detail. And as Dr. Towns cho told you, the first man-made uh, Maser device. Uh, stimulated emission device was the ammonium beam maser, which uh, came here in uh, 1951 uh, through 1954. And then uh, the first pumped maser device was Bloomberg's microwave solid state maser in 1956. And then uh, a lot of things happened right in here that I'll, I'll tell you about shortly. And uh, in uh, May 1960, uh, uh, Naaman built the first, the world's first laser, and at that point, the, the laser era uh, burst open with the the, uh, the results that we all know. I now, think this is very important what you're showing, showing that the physics was all there 30 years before the idea came along. The physics was all there. Yes, thank you. Char Dr. Townsend has pointed out the physics. The physics was all there, and I, I'll respond with a little bit of a, of an engineering viewpoint that. Uh, when you think back here, I'm not sure th there were no coherent oscillators or even amplifiers that I know about in uh, around 1910 or thereabouts. Uh, certainly, Einstein never bought a stereo amplifier. And, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure how much physicists in that era would have even thought about the concept of amplification, coherent amplification, and... Uh, and uh, oscillation. Um, so that may have been one of the hindrances also. In any event, uh, uh, in 1916, 17, Einstein wrote uh, a paper in which he pointed out that uh, uh, if you had, uh, if these mysterious quantum levels that atoms seem to have, uh, that you, you, could, uh, you could, atoms in an upper level would spontaneously come downward uh, in the lower level, they would uh, could be lifted upward by shining radiation through, and uh, uh, and he suggested thinking primarily about getting a thermodynamic balance in black body radiation uh, that you needed to introduce the idea that an atom in the upper level could be stimulated to come down as 
uh, again, Dr. Towns has already mentioned. And uh, he was not, I think, thinking at all about amplification or gain, that's my guess at least. And he actually uh, apparently did not use the word, the term stimulated emission. That came from a little later from Van Vleck around 1924. And um, maybe the first person to talk seriously about um, uh, amplification was Richard Tolman in 1924, a PhysRev paper that's still very readable. Um, uh, that, uh, and uh, the process of negative absorption from analogy with classical mechanics would presumably be of such a nature as to reinforce the primary beam coming through this uh, medium if there were more, uh, if there were enough atoms in the uh, in an upper uh, upper energy level. And interestingly, uh, uh, Richard Tolman was a professor at Caltech, I believe, during your, uh, during Professor Towns's, uh, Dr. Towns's uh, uh, PhD era, although you did not directly work with him. As, uh, um, uh, and about the same year, uh, Hendrik Kramers added an interesting uh, physical concept to this. Uh, remember, this is still before quantum uh, mechanics has come along. Namely, that uh, the response of an atom included both a, an absorptive and a dispersive or phase shifting uh, part. And that if you uh, put an atom into one of its upper states, you would get a stimulated emission term of opposite sign or a response of opposite sign, but you would also change the sign of the dispersive uh, part. This so-called negative dispersion is closely connected with the prediction made by Einstein uh, that an atom uh, will exhibit a negative uh, absorption. And uh, that turns out to be uh, important in some ways in frequency polling effects in lasers and also interesting in later on. So now we come to the, uh, uh, the 15 years, let's say, from, the 19, from 1925 through the 1930s when uh, quantum theory and resonance physics are born. And again, I will, uh, time doesn't permit to talk about this in detail, but uh, the, uh, quantum mechanics is born in the marvelous year of 1925 with Heisenberg and Schrodinger and, and uh, Dirac and, uh, and Born and, uh, and others. Um, and uh, one thing I would just throw in here is that I, 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 uh, a, a remarkable number of, of incredibly precise experiments testing quantum mechanics have been done with um, uh, using lasers. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not, can't claim, can't claim expertise in that field myself, but I've asked many people about this. Uh, who are real experts, and, and the response seemed to be that nothing, no measurement that has been made with a laser has in any way violated or changed the fundamental foundation that Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger uh, laid at that point. Uh, you can do many things that demonstrate and, and many fascinating phenomena that come out of quantum mechanics, but, uh, but everything that's been done supports uh, the fundamental uh, uh, problem. Now, um, in the next uh, 15 years and beyond, atomic resonance physics, the interaction of light or, or radiation and atoms, uh, was, came to be understood and came to be uh, uh, explored in many ways. Um, and from my point of view as, a, as, a, as an electrical engineer, uh, an interesting point also is that it was in the late 1930s that uh, a lot of RF and microwave tools began to be uh, developed. Uh, microwave waveguides at Bell Labs and, and some others that, I, that I'll show you. And particularly klystron oscillators at, uh, by the Varian brothers at Stanford. And uh, concepts of negative feedback oscillators and signal generators from Bell Labs and also from... Uh, uh, Hewlett Pack and Packard and uh, Ed Ginston and so on. So uh, I mentioned earlier the dispersion effects and so what I'm just going to point out quickly here is that in 1933, uh, Ladenberg did some experiments which may have been the first uh, experiments that tested Einstein's prediction of downward transitions. That is, they did the spectroscopic, uh, they studied the dispersive effects of spectral lines, the wavelength this way and and fringes this way using something that's sometimes called the hook method. And they found that as they turned up the current in the discharge tube and measured the strength of these uh, responses, 
uh, the strength went up rapidly as you put more atoms into the lower level, but as you increased the, the, the current and began to get atoms into the upper level, this curve would turn over and come down because the upper level atoms were canceling the lower level atoms. And uh, Ladenberg observed this, but never actually saw any kind of population inversion, so these curves never went uh, negative. Um, I'd also just like to do uh, quickly uh, put a word in here for um, uh, a man named W. W. Hansen, who I think is an unsung uh, hero and technologist and physicist. Uh, this is uh, this is W. Uh, w. Hansen. He he's the one who invented and patented the microwave cavity in 1936. And these figures here do not come from uh, some electromagnetic theory textbook, although you would think they. They look very much like uh, Raymond and Winery or one of those. They're uh, from his original patent on this. He also uh, uh, invented the linear accelerator, and this is the first section of a, of a linear accelerator uh, pipe, and uh, uh, lived long enough to see the first crude acceleration of electrons by microwaves and to write a famous four-word final report we, to the Office of Naval Research, we have accelerated electrons. Uh, that, uh, that's a nice thing to be able to do. He had uh, spent a, a large part of his, a, a lot of time earlier on uh, m machining beryllium. And uh, this was fatal to him at a, at a, uh, at a very early uh, age. Um, so now, unfortunately, we come to uh, World War II. Uh, a black period, obviously, for uh, many, many people in the, uh, uh, through the world. Uh, but what, one thing that it did bring was massive advances in technology, uh, massive developments in radio frequency and microwave technology, radar, but also signal detection and electronics and oscilloscopes from laboratories here in the UK, the magnetron, and so on. And Many leading academic physicists moved for the duration, was the <coughs> phrase, to uh, uh, a place called the Radiation Laboratory at MIT that was concerned with uh, radar and countermeasures and also to other places, Harvard Radio Research Laboratory, Columbia, Bell, and so on. And um, this led not only to many uh, technical advances but to unprecedented post-war government funding for university research. Uh, the Office of Naval Research, Army Research Office, and AFOSR were all founded uh, at the end of this uh, period. And as uh, the war came to an end in the middle 1940s, many of these academic physicists moved back to their academic home bases from the Rad Lab and RRL. And they took with them not only the knowledge that they had developed during that time, but they literally, in many cases, carried with them their equipment, their signal generators, their radar sets, and, uh, and so on, to use them as instrumentation um, uh, uh, to, to, in the end, win something like a dozen Nobel Prizes coming out of ra uh, Radiation Laboratory uh, alumni, Rad Lab alumni. Now, I just will mention very briefly that in 1940, in a sort of remote part of uh, Russia, not in Moscow, uh, uh, a foreseeing man named Faberkant uh, wrote uh, uh, some papers which pointed out that uh, uh, if you could get N2 over N1 populations greater than the G values for uh, uh, the corresponding levels, uh, you could get a, a radiation output greater than the incident radiation um, and that you might observe this in a, dis in a gas discharge even though um, uh, it's not been observed but it is, he said, in principle uh, obtainable. And there were some sub subsequent patents and so on that stemmed from this but no active uh, actual experimental results that I uh, know about although I think Bazov and Prokhorov must have known about this work. Um, so now we're coming uh, to the uh, immediate post-war years, and uh, in the first five years after the war, I think uh, in addition to the, to the uh, uh, molecular spectroscopy that Dr. Towns has mentioned, um, uh, radio frequency magnetic resonance of nuclear spins was a subject of, of great interest. And, uh, and was uh, uh, developed uh, essentially in parallel but in, uh, by uh, 
people at, uh, at Stanford, led by Felix Bloch, and at Harvard, uh, by, uh, uh, Harvard University by per, uh, Purcell and, uh, and Pound. And uh, Kassler in France also studied uh, uh, the optical pumping of nuclear spin levels, although he seems to have done this mostly for spectroscopy rather than, uh, well, all of this was done for spectroscopy and basic, basic knowledge. And I'll show you some results from this. This is, uh, I'm very quickly, uh, this is uh, um, Felix Bloch with the assistance of Hansen and Packard, uh, Martin Packard, not the Packard of Hewlett Packard, um, were doing, ex uh, began to do experiments using RF signals applied to uh, uh, the protons in water. Um, and uh, uh, they used a kind of a large signal dynamic um, uh, uh, approach in which with relatively strong RF signals they would force these spins to flip around and flip over and run through pre, uh, complex processions uh, and during this at some po at, at, uh, uh, during this process a population inversion although a very weak and very temporary one would be established and if you interpret these curves properly which I won't even attempt to uh, do this may be the first, this, uh, this from a brief uh, FISREV letter may be the, uh, or phys, uh, letter in physical review, may be the first published dem, uh, observation of uh, uh, a record of, of an inversion, a population inversion in an atomic uh, or molecular system. Now, uh, the P, uh, Purcell and Pound at Harvard we're doing uh, much uh, cleaner experiments on, uh, on spins in a crystal, and although the signals were very weak that they saw, uh, they, uh, they were, the lifetimes were relatively uh, of these, when you created the population inversion were relatively long. And so this is, a, is essentially a nuclear magnetic resonance trace. Um, the time scale is one minute per division. This is weak absorption measured in the system at thermal equilibrium. By essentially re rapidly reversing the DC magnetic field, they were able to put the spins, the spin po level populations in an inverted state here and then probe it with time. And you could watch the, uh, the, uh, what was described as a, the, correctly as a negative temperature situation decay back uh, to an uninverted uh, system. So this is a, really a, a beautiful uh, uh, experiment, experimental demonstration, and, um, and uh, introduced also the very important thermodynamic concept of, uh, of uh, uh, negative temperature as a way of describing this situation. So then, uh, as you've already heard, 1951 to 54, uh, Towns invented uh, the ammonia beam measure on the park bench. Uh, Gordon Zeiger and Towns made the, the first uh, successful uh, device, a, a relatively narrow band, 22 gigahertz amplifier and oscillator, coined the name Maser. Um, and uh, in, that, in that era, uh, a number of other uh, proposals uh, followed from this, a brief note by a man named Joseph Weber on Masers, on Maser amplification. A very perceptive uh, pair of patents by mm. Robert Dickey, who, uh, who uh, is, was a very deserving person who perhaps didn't uh, get the, uh, all the recognition that he in fact deserved. And uh, the proposals that have already been mentioned by Combersound and Towns and, and I think Strandberg and maybe and others. Um, and so this is the picture you've already seen and I think I have a bigger one so um, this is again uh, the molecular beam going through here and the, uh, the uh, radiation coming out this tiny millimeter wave uh, up here and old fashioned vacuum pumps down here and uh, uh, graduate students who apparently wore suits and ties in the, uh, <laughs> in the, uh, in the laboratory. Um, uh, he, he is almost better dressed than you were. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and then two years later, uh, Bloombergen's microwave solid state maser, uh, Nico wrote a very elegant, uh, definitive, uh, short uh, article in Physical Review in 1956, 
Um, his patent uh, is quite far-reaching, but uh, uh, Harvard wasn't really in the business of exploiting patents in those days. Um, and uh, Bell Laboratories uh, heard about this and had uh, all the technologies. You could just walk down the hall and as you down the hallway, and as you went, you could collect a, a helium neon doer, a big electromagnet, a lot of microwaves, and and to make one of these within a few months. And there were an immense number of immediate and extensions and applications of these, um, including uh, ruby being used as a microwave material, phonon measures that, uh, uh, that amplified sound waves, applications uh, led by uh, work by towns in radio and radar astronomy, echo satellite experiments, space communications, and as already mentioned, Penzias and Wilson's, uh, Wilson's uh, observation a few years later of the three K, uh, degree K background radiation. Now, these microwave measures, in a way, were easy enough to make that almost anyone could make them, even, even I could make one. And so instead of a picture, uh, what you see is uh, uh, is a, pic, uh, a, a drawing from a, a actually literally from a, a technical report, a contract report from my, my uh, laboratory at Stanford showing uh, a cavity type uh, ruby laser pumped at 10 gigahertz down through a waveguide here and then a cavity down here with a kind of a strip line uh, uh, structure, res the cavity is resonant at 10 gigahertz, the strip line structure is, with a capacitive gap is, re is resonant at three gigahertz. The ruby is over here and the signal goes, goes in and out here and it makes a, a very low noise microwave amplifier with a few megahertz bandwidth. I had worked earlier on traveling wave tubes and slow wave structures and so uh, I, I was immediately led a year later to uh, make a traveling wave microwave measure. Now the pump is coming down again, the X-band uh, waveguide um, and the signal is uh, coming down and traveling along a slow wave circuit here with the inverted gainy slabs of ruby on top of it and, and going out here. And that, that gave uh, more bandwidth, although still not a, a particularly uh, large uh, amount. And uh, so now it's the late 1950s, these things have happened. And, uh, and as uh, Dr. Tells has already told you, we're evolving toward the laser. And uh, so uh, uh, the, the detailed Shallow and Towns analysis in 1958 and uh, stimulated much interest among other workers. Uh, the first quantum electronics conference at Shawanga Lodge in September 1959, which brought together <coughs> A couple of hundred, I think it was, of the uh, all the active uh, people in the field, in, in, organized by uh, Charlie and uh, and uh, um, and uh, I. This is a, an opportune time, perhaps, to say that that uh, my admiration for Dr. Towns uh, is is not only for his immense scientific and. Uh, uh, and uh, contributions, uh, probably several Nobel Prizes in there, but his record of public service on many occasions, uh, even in the midst of a very uh, uh, busy uh, career. And I'll, I'll also just mention briefly that uh, uh, there was a, a, a graduate student in another group um, at, um, uh, uh, called Gordon Gould, named Gordon Gould, um, who uh, was not working on directly on, on uh, measures of lasers, but had ideas that he uh, was attempting to uh, uh, put together for uh, using these principles at, at optical frequencies. And, uh, and uh, he put some of these ideas in a notebook, and, and uh, uh, there were some conversations, which you can read about in, in Dr. Towns' book, uh, um, and... Uh, and uh, 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 led to a 30-year uh, patent battle that, that uh, seemed to go on uh, forever. So here is the, the opening paragraph of this paper, uh, Shalom Towns, 1958. Uh, the extension of major techniques to the infrared and optical region is considered. Um, and uh, 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 the... Uh, and this is the abstract of it, and as, as we've already said, this set a lot of people, a lot of very uh, uh, distinguished people 
uh, trying to make uh, this, uh, trying to make uh, the reality that came from this paper. Um, this is a, a picture taken at this first quantum electronics conference uh, in Shawanga Lodge, which was a, uh, a resort uh, in the Catskill Mountains north of New York City, where uh, a great many uh, uh, New Yorkers would vacation with their families. And so you see here uh, Jim Gordon, uh, Bossoff, Herb Zeiger, uh, A.M. Prokhorov, and uh, Charlie Towns, and, uh, and uh, five interesting uh, personalities here. Uh, uh, Prokhorov was, the, was the, uh, uh, the PhD supervisor, I believe, of, uh, of Bossoff, and uh, was a very jovial and genial man. For those of you who may remember Danny Kay, which will date those of us who do. <laughs> um, he was sort of the Russian uh, Danny Kay. Uh, Basov was a, a more intense and uh, dynamic and driving uh, personality um, and uh, 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 built, um, um, uh, became quite a leading figure in the, in the uh, uh, scientific, in the Soviet scientific establishment. Um, and ultimately, the two of them split and each had their own institute and were uh, fairly competitive. And my understanding is that they are now buried side by side in a mon <laughs> monastery somewhere outside of, Mol outside of Moscow. And whether they like this or not, I, I, <laughs> they're, they're, unable to, uh, they're unable to say. Uh, so here's um, uh, the... Uh, here is the uh, steering committee meeting of this uh, of this uh, uh, of this meeting held at the meeting, and I hope I can uh, uh, not have a mental block on names. Uh, this, I believe, was uh, a man named G. J. Stanley from uh, Caltech, whom I didn't know very well. Irving Rowe, who was uh, a, a program manager at the Office of Naval Research and supported uh, the meeting. Um, this is um, da, 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 da. Uh, this is uh, Maimon's boss from Hughes, uh, um, and uh, seated, I'll think of his name in a minute here. Seated next to him is Rudy Kampfner, who may be a name that's known to some of you, a Viennese-born uh, uh, architect who um, uh, became uh, who uh, uh, was interned and then uh, became a. Uh, uh, contributor to microwave electronics of uh, some distinction in, in during the war in the UK, went to Bell Laboratories, was a colleague of uh, John R. Pierce and others, um, and, um, uh, and eventually ended up briefly at Stanford. This is Charles, Charles Towns, this is Charles Cattell, um, um, who uh, many of you name, many of you I'm sure will know. I, I guess there's a little uncertainty whether this is Woody Strandberg or, or uh, someone uh, else. Woody. Pardon? That's Woody. That's Woody. Okay. Well, I'm uh, good. Uh, I, I, you and I were, were disagreeing at one point, I think, on that or somebody. Uh, this is uh, Nico Bloombergen in a very natty suit. Uh, ben Lax, uh, who was at the MIT uh, Magnet Laboratory and... Uh, uh, and uh, did uh, many things, uh, including some related to semiconductors. This is uh, Robert Dickey, of whom we've been, uh, who, of whom we've been speaking. And then way back in this corner is a very, very incredibly young, incredibly naive me. And uh, I, I wish I had known the. Co I wish I had understood the company I was in at that time. I would have collected autographs around the table and uh, been able, maybe, to finance retirement with it. Um, with them. Um, so, uh, uh, 1960, the laser era bursts open. Um, Maimon and his colleagues make the first ruby. Um, uh, Sorokin and Stevenson at uh, uh, IBM, who have already been working on uh, rare earth crystals as potential laser materials, uh, immediately realize that the pulsed <coughs> flash lamp is what they need and uh, within a few months make lasers. And then um, uh, at the end of that year, uh, Javon Bennett and Harriet uh, using a, a gas discharge with RF excitation and collisions of the second kind make uh, the first helium neon laser. A, ra a rather more difficult uh, task, uh, 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 one should certainly concede. 
So here's a picture of Maimon's, of the, I believe this is, if not the, uh, the components that he used, it certainly is essentially the components that, the, that uh, he used in the first laser. These are his hands, incidentally. Um, and uh, uh, so here's a little bit bigger picture of this. So uh, the stubby ruby, a, a centimeter or so long, and, uh, and uh, uh, silvered ends on the ruby, the spiral photographic flash lamp essentially bought off the shelf uh, or from an EG and G catalog and just the enclosure that this was, uh, was put inside. Uh, here, on the other hand, is uh, Ali Javan's first. I, this I am, do not know whether this is in fact Ali Javan's first gas discharge laser or just something very close to it. But the picture at least shows you what it looks like, and you can, can see in the refreshments room uh, the uh, Colin Webb and, and the Balak's uh, uh, somewhat similar and except much better engineered uh, gas laser. And uh, uh, you can, you can uh, understand the difficulty of trying to get a mirror here, a tiny mirror here, uh, getting them exactly parallel and making this lays with a, with a gain that's going to be a few percent along the length of this t net amplification of a few percent, very de delicately dependent on, on gas composition, impurities, discharge, and, and uh, so on. Uh, here's a, a, a little more polished picture. Um, Ali Javan, Bill Bennett Jr., and uh, Don Harriet, uh, who was the optics expert in the group, and, uh, and uh, Bennett, I think, had a lot of spectroscopy, and, uh, and uh, this is, is certainly one of their early uh, gas lasers at uh, Bell Laboratories. Um, and uh, they, does this have the look of a collimator, maybe? Yes, all the collimator. All the collimator, alignment telescope. Um, so uh, 1961 and 62, the laser era bursts uh, open. Um, and uh, uh, within the next year, 1961, uh, Eli Snitzer has invented glass lasers, rare neodymium glass lasers, laser cue switching, harmonic generation, and even optical fiber lasers. Uh, I'll show you in a minute, uh, have, been, have been proposed if not made. Uh, 1962, the visible red helium neon laser that was the workhorse f for so many of us for so long and is now being replaced by diodes. Other gas lasers by Patel, Bennett, Faust, and so on. Raman laser action, and even three different laboratories who successfully made gallium arsenide semiconductor electrically pumped diode lasers, although they only operated at liquid helium or maybe liquid nitrogen uh, temperatures. And uh, so here's uh, Eli Snitzer's uh, fiber lasers. Uh, this simple pumping structure, you just wrap the fiber around a, a flash lamp like this. Uh, not very efficient, not, not very good use of the, of the flash lamp. And, and uh, in, at least in 1964, Snitzer made uh, laser amplifiers, uh, laser oscillators and laser amplifiers. And why it took us another, whatever it was, another 40 years to get the internet into our Houses, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, so, and uh, um, another interesting note is that the first laser medical treatment was the um, uh, successful destruction of a retinal tumor uh, in a child's eye using a uh, ruby, uh, using an American optical ruby, ruby laser photocoagulator that was also used to repair detached uh, uh, retinas. So uh, it did not take long for uh, applications to uh, come along. And here's one that I, I, uh, I like just because I guess I like it, but uh, in 1962, actually, be, uh, uh, although the publication date was July, the work was actually done in less than two years after the uh, uh, Maimon's laser. Um, uh, Smullen and Fioco at MIT uh, uh, built a 50 joule, which is a ruby laser, which is a big ruby rod and a big laser, um, and hooked it up to a 12 inch telescope and pointed it at the moon and put a sensitive photo detector on, uh, 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 on a 48 inch telescope to, de to, to detect the response. And uh, they sent out something like, I don't know, it would have been 10 to the 17th or 10 to the 18th photons to the moon, just reflecting off the 10% dusty surface of the moon, and got a, a photon or two per shot back. 
um, and, uh, but they, they successfully ranged to the moon and uh, you have to like the title of their, uh, of their proceedings of IRE, Project Lunacy. And um, <laughs> I, I've also always really admired the, uh, the insouciance or the confidence of the opening sentence of this, which says, in order to determine some of the possibilities of optical maser radar, we conducted experiments with the moon as a target. <laughs> it seems like you could have used a building near, <laughs> closer in, but... Uh, um, and uh, 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 moon ranging to retro reflectors, laser ranging to retro reflectors on the moon is measuring distances to the moon uh, uh, to a precision of millimeters these days. And part of the results of that have been to confirm, for example, that the, the, uh, by, by these incredibly accurate measurements of the orbits of the Earth and the moon uh, derived from this, uh, that the gravitational constant G cannot have changed by as much as a part in 10 to the 12th in the past uh, uh, 30 years or thereabouts since those uh, measurements started um, and other, other impressive relativistic uh, results. So 1936, the laser field, uh, 1963 to 66, the laser field really exploded. Liquid lasers, mode locking, uh, CO2 laser, neodymium MIAG laser, two workhorses of uh, today, pulse nitrogen laser leading ultimately to other uh, lasers, ion lasers, chemical lasers, the photodissociation laser, and organic dye lasers had all been demonstrated within uh, five or six years after the, uh, the first laser. Um, now, I thought you might like to see this lovely uh, picture uh, of uh, Charles Towns and Francis uh, sitting on a, a slightly larger than life-size uh, cast uh, statue of the original uh, park bench that he sat on and, uh, um, and uh, he looks nearly as good uh, now as he did then or, and, and uh, today and uh, here's the notebook uh, with, uh, with writing in it. Uh, so this, this is, uh, in most uh, southern uh, U.S. towns there's a statue of a Confederate general on horseback is in the plaza. <laughs> But uh, in Greenville, which is a lovely town, uh, there's this, this uh, remarkable uh, statue. Um, uh, just a quick mention of uh, uh, four books that uh, are certainly to be recommended if you'd like to look further into this and also have been great value to me, of course, in, in deriving much of this background. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Town's memoir, How the Laser Had Happened, Adventures of a Scientist, um, uh, a book by... Uh, uh, Theodore Maiman, Ted Maiman, called The Laser Odyssey. And as some of you may know, and I haven't had time to say, there were some, some real screw-ups, as we would say, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the initial publication of his work and, uh, and uh, that made him not totally happy. And he is, was, in any event, a very plain-spoken person. And so this is, is very entertaining uh, reading. Um, uh, and, and I think a very honest, uh, honest reading. Uh, he is, of course, here receiving the National Medal of Science from, uh, from uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, president. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't get to meet any kings or, uh, well, he, I guess he met the Emperor of Japan uh, and received the Japan Prize. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, a book written by a journalist, Nick Taylor, as told to him by uh, Gordon Gould, largely. And it's the story of this uh, long 30-year uh, patent war and uh, so on. And I, 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 it seems to me to be a, an honest book, in essence, but uh, it also uh, reinforces my considerable skepticism about the patent system generally. Um, and um, so, uh, and finally, uh, uh, Jeff Hecht, a science journalist, has, uh, has written a generally well-received book uh, published by Oxford Press on, the, uh, on BEAM, the race to make the laser. And, and he says, frankly, at the end that he thinks uh, uh, Mayman should, one way or another, have gotten a Nobel Prize. Two final applications just to, get to uh, illustrate the, the variety of things. One is to get a chance to look at Arthur Shalow. Uh, this is a Buck Rogers ray gun bought at the toy store at Toys R Us uh, and his technician took out the flashlight that was in it and put in a little ruby laser and uh, Art Schultz delighted in using this 
to, to shoot down Mickey Mouse. This is a Mickey Mouse balloon, a clear outer balloon, a, a black Mickey Mouse inside it. You buy it at the San Francisco Zoo. Um, and I'm within two minutes of <laughs> physical. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so you have Mickey Mouse inside here. And uh, uh, if you focus the light in so that it's passing through the clear outer surface uh, without much absorption and with a fairly large diameter, and focus it on a spot inside uh, on the surface of the black Mickey Mouse balloon, you can, you can pop Mickey. Uh, you can do Mickey in without destroying the outer balloon. And it was great, great fun, and Arthur loved it, but, uh, but it also is, is serious in that one of the standard techniques for repairing many damages in the uh, diabetic retinopathy, uh, bleeding from uh, uh, vessels, detached retinas at the, in, the, uh, in the retina, are uh, treated in essentially this in, in essentially this fashion by painlessly sending a laser beam in through a la through the front of the eye, and either creating some scar tissue to stop the bleeding or a spot weld essentially to fasten the retina in place. And I, I know laser company people who are very proud of the fact that m literally millions of people around the world uh, are, are have vision today who would not have it without this. Uh, now, uh, I've just been a, a week at, uh, at a uh, uh, big conference in Stuttgart on, uh, on the laser manufacturing systems with impressive uh, uh, huge welding uh, machines, uh, making uh, ship decks and putting uh, your automobiles together. Um, and I just want to point out that not all laser, uh, not all laser applications are uh, commercially successful. Uh, this is the laser cigarette lighter with an argon laser, and you do have to wear safety glasses if you're going to uh, going to use it. So I would finally like to close just by uh, uh, just by saying uh, the, this has been a remarkable field and one to be. I feel very privileged to have been a part of and uh, to have met such wonderful people. We should not. Uh, overlook the fact that Mother Nature has been making uh, natural masers and lasers in space, uh, some of them with immense powers um, and pumped by uh, light from nearby stars or, or various other mechanisms. And these were only began to be discovered actually in 1965, but Mother Nature has been doing this for uh, billions of years now. So thank you very much for your uh, attention.